Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the artistic director of the festival, and I'm very pleased to present the big idea addressing a crisis. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I am situated tonight is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We hope you follow the sponsorship acknowledgement video that was playing before the event started. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival. We're grateful to all the organizations and individuals who support us. And for this event, I would especially like to thank our co-presenter, The Walrus Magazine, Florence Campbell, author patron of Hassan Alcantar, and Shea Piggy and Panchon Cho Bakery, author patrons of Carol Off. This event is an hour and 30 minutes long and includes a question and answer period. We welcome you to enter your questions in the Q&A box at any point during the event. You'll find this if you're on a computer at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's also a raise your hand function, um, which you can use uh, or a star nine if you're using a phone to um, raise your hand and ask your question out loud. As a thank you to you for continuing to support Kingston Writers Fest and joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we are randomly selecting a pre-registered participant of this event following their Q&A to win a copy of Hassan's book. We are doing a book draw for every onstage event throughout the festival. Now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's moderator, Carol Off. Carol is the longtime moderator of the Kingston Writers Fest, The Big Idea. She's also the co-host of CBC Radio's As It Happens, a Canadian interview show that airs on CBC Radio One in Canada and various public radio stations in the United States through Public Radio International. Carol also has a long time involvement with the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression and has won numerous awards for her media work, including a Gemini and two gold medals from the New York Festival of Television. A distinguished career in journalism has taken her around the globe to cover major events, and she's the author of numerous books, including All We Leave Behind, A Reporter's Journey into the Lives of Others, which was a finalist for the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing, the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, and the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction, and which won the British Columbia National Award for Canadian Nonfiction. Please welcome Carol. Hello and good evening. I want to start this session with reading you a little something. A poem called Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. And that's the opening of a poem by a Somali poet, Warsan Shirif. First time I read this poem, it was the first time I truly understood or began to understand what it was like to suddenly have to run for your life, to leave everything that you know, and to go someplace else with absolutely no certainty that you would arrive where you needed to. And that's in this poem where I learned that no one leaves home unless they have to. Good evening, welcome to The Big Idea. And um, we never came up with a good name for this revised panel. The, you've seen it on uh, the literature. The name of it was, is Canada nice? And at the time that we devised that, it made sense. We wanted to talk about whether, uh, whether we thought Canada actually was a nice place or that was a bit of a mythology. But when we realized that we are dealing with yet another crisis like Syria, where we had uh, welcomed so many refugees into Canada, that we had another crisis in Afghanistan after the Taliban took over the country and, the, and Afghanistan and Kabul fell to the Taliban. We knew that we had to address that crisis as well. 
And as we see thousands of Afghans now arrive, as we've seen thousands of Syrians arrive, looking for shelter, looking for refuge, I thought maybe this panel should be called Home. And uh, I wanted to read, it's, it's a very long poem. I urge you to look it up and read it. And but I want to just read it with you just to set us up for this evening's discussion. I want to read you the last stanzas of this poem. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs, leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I have become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. So that is essentially what we're going to talk about is the idea that people come here for refuge. And we're also going to talk about more largely what responsibilities we have as a country and as people to help those who are forced to leave the only thing that they know, their home. And to imagine what that would be like for us, because it's not impossible that it could be us at some point. We're gonna speak with three men on this panel and uh, talk about seeking refuge and what happens when home becomes the mouth of a shark. We have Bilal Sawari with us tonight. Bilal is one of the most trusted journalists in all of Afghanistan. He's somebody that we all turn to for a larger understanding of what was happening in the country for his intelligence and his trustworthy reporting, which is I, I absolutely the most key part of trying to penetrate um, a lot of, of misunderstandings and a lot of garbage that comes out of any of these situations. But Bilal was someone we could turn to. He is now in Canada. And he told me just after he arrived in an interview with As It Happens, he said, he said I felt like a knife had been inserted into my heart. I was broken from within. And that's how he described it, what it was like to have to leave his home. We have with us also Hassan Al-Kantar. And uh, Hassan is from Syria, now in Canada, in Northern British Columbia, and uh, but hoping to get back to uh, quickly to Vancouver where he feels a great kinship with people there. He has written a remarkable book about his flight from his home and it's his mind boggling efforts to find somewhere to call home. And the uh, trials and difficulties uh, include months in prison, uh, going from place to place, getting on flights with the last money he has, but also most remarkably, the seven months he spent in an airport in Kuala Lumpur stateless, basically uh, in orbit, not having any place to go back to or go forward to, and uh, surviving on donations and goodwill, and where he became a kind of Shahrazad. He was kind of like 1,001 nights. As long as he was telling his story, as long as we were calling him, others were calling, the world was looking to him for his, his stories. As long as he was telling his stories, he felt he could survive, and people rallied to his support because of that remarkable thing. So two great storytellers, Bilal Sarwari and Hassan al uh, the His book, um, Hassan's book, Man at the Airport, is jaw-dropping. You will laugh and cry equally. And as he tells his journey to Canada. So we'll hear from Hassan. We also have with us Graham Smith, who is, among many things, one of my favorite people. Um, he is a foreign, he was foreign correspondent for the Globe and Mail when I first started following him. I only re realized recently that he was practically a child when he was doing that. I, I thought you were much more mature. You were more mature. I thought you were much older. Uh, but he broke many very important and disturbing stories about our mission in Afghanistan. 
He then became, uh, after leaving journalism, he became a political affairs officer for the United Nations. And then he uh, moved on to become a senior an analyst for the International Crisis Group. His book, the, Dog, the Dogs Are Eating Them Now, Our War in Afghanistan, is startling and informed and must reading for even now uh, uh, to tell us why the, that mission went so well, so horribly wrong. Uh, Graham told us in that book, and he told me in interviews that Afghanistan broke his heart. He's also just completed a haunting documentary called Ghosts of Afghanistan, which you may have seen on TVO, and, uh, but that is available online to watch as well. And so I welcome also from Tuscany, of all places where Graham is now setting up shop with his family, and he is joining us tonight from Italy. So welcome to you as well, Graham. Hello, all three of you. Do we have you? Go, maybe. Hello. <laughs> Okay, there you are, voices. <laughs> Great, lovely. Um, I, I'm going to, as people who've uh, attended this session before, more, mostly in Kingston, I know that the big idea what we usually do is they start with a bit of an interview with each panelist so we can know a bit more about, we get to know who they are and their backstory before we go into a, a larger discussion. And so I'm going to begin with that, with, with Hassan, and say hello to you again. Hello, Hassan. Hello. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And it, it's, it's such a long journey you had to get to Canada. And uh, I talked to you from uh, on the phone from as it happens when you were at the airport in Kuala Lumpur for a long time. And for, I guess first of all, I want to ask, how is life in Canada? I cannot complain. Uh, I'm... Um... I'm still trying and still enjoying each and every minute of it. Um, and sometimes even at the morning I wake up and I uh, just can't understand life uh, uh, fully yet. Uh, how weird, unfair, uh, injustice it is, yet generous. Uh, a man who uh, was hopeless, calling for a place he can call home. And yet now he is in Northern BC, uh, enjoying the weather, enjoying the nature, the people. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and I'm grateful. And I consider myself one of the luckiest because others, uh, they are going through what I went, uh, but they could not manage to have the same result, the one I had. So uh, I'm, I'm happy. You had a wonderful story. I just want for people to know um, how inspiring this was. When, and I, I got all weepy when you told the story on As It Happens. But you told the story of what it was like when you, your first arrival and you went outside. And what did you see? The snow. It was the first, uh, the first storm in Whistler, the first uh, time it snowed that, that, that season. And I'm from a mountain area from Syria, and I got used to snow, but I did not see snow at that time since 11 years because I was living in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, for 11 years. Uh, I told myself, uh, do not act like a kid in a Christmas day. Uh, but, uh, others will make fun at you, but I could not. I kept, I, I spent my first night outside drinking coffee and uh, uh, watching snowfall. And uh, it was surreal and overwhelming because at the very same day, I was in a cell, uh, five by six feet cell, over overcrowded with four, more than 40 uh, inmates. And that was in the morning. And in the evening, I was in Whistler, Canada. So um, that was uh, too much to take. Uh, but uh, I never tried drugs before, but I think it gave me that, <laughs> that sense of, uh, of, of being uh, uh, drugged. Hassan, tell us a bit about, I just think it's a very large story, I know, and we, we, I think people know quite a bit about the what happened in Syria. There are lots of people in Kingston who are watched, who come to this event, who were, I know, sponsors of refugees from Syria, so they're familiar with the story. But can you just tell us a bit about how home became the mouth of a shark for you? Why did you have to leave your home? 
I, I left my home uh, for the first time in 2006 to United Arab Emirates because as many young Syrians, I was looking for a brighter future. Uh, but uh, when the Syrian war and everything was going great until 2011, I had a, a work visa there and uh, my career was booming. But when the Syrian war took place in 2011, everything changed my destiny. I no longer become in control of my own destiny. Others were controlling my destiny. I refused to join the war. Um, I refused to join the army. Uh, therefore, they refused to renew my passport. So I lost my, uh, my, my work permit in Dubai. And I lived until 2017 illegal and hide and run. Uh, homeless, jobless most of the time. And uh, finally they detained me. They sent me to Malaysia because it's one of a few countries who accepted Syria on arrival visa. After three months on Malay in Malaysia, I tried to go to Ecuador, but Turkey Airlines uh, did not allow me to board. Then as a desperate solution, I tried to go to Cambodia, but they sent me back to Malaysia. Malaysia did not accept me to enter again. And that's, I ran out of option and I stuck at the airport. And um, no other country uh, would, uh, would welcome me. So I, I was stateless. But you became at the same time as you were stateless, you became international because you were able to capture the imaginations of people around the world who were calling you for interview. Once we, you were discovered, this man at the airport, we, everyone wanted to know how you were doing. And it, it, was, it was, and also that helped you to get people who would give you things. That, and I know you had an, have an you speak of not have, having a drug addiction, you are addicted to coffee. And I know that you had people helping you get your fix uh, and also look for some place to sleep under a stairwell or on a, on a piece of furniture of the floor. It was an unusual situation and it was a hostile environment with all the authorities in Malaysia trying to jail me or to send me back to Syria. Uh, but uh, there were two different periods at the time at the airport. The first one when I was hopeless, powerless, voiceless, trying to seek an official uh, reasonable solution through NGOs or United Nations or, or any embassy. But I failed and they all turned their back to me and they said, sorry, we cannot help you. And that's when I decided not to go down without a fight and turn into social media. And at that moment, I become, because of individuals around the globe, I become a, a powerful voice uh, with a voice and uh, protected by these stra those strangers. The small things, uh, how to take a shower, how to sleep, when to take uh, a shower, how to dry your clothes, um, uh, where you can find some bees. Uh, uh, it's all annoying, but um, once I discovered, I asked myself uh, the right questions. Uh, what do I want? Why I'm doing this? What does it mean to be Syrian? What, do I, what did I want people to understand, to hear? Uh, at that moment, I become a different person, I had a purpose, I had a goal I need to achieve. And then I told myself, wait a minute, I never heard about anyone who died because he was sleeping on a chair or sitting on an airport. People are sitting on refugee camps. From that point on, it did, it did, it did not matter anymore what was going to happen. And I discovered that who we become during our march toward our dream is more important than the dream itself. Uh, you will, it's a rebirth. You will rediscover yourself. You will become proud of what you are doing in belief. And for the first time, I can now claim I was for the first time in love with what I'm doing uh, because of individuals. And uh, uh, you need a fight, here is a fight. And uh, then I felt the responsibility because I finally was representing Syrians on a uh, global stage uh, through the media and social media. And uh, the way I re represented myself with what made my story unique. Hassan, we'll come back and uh, we'll hear more of it and how you came to Canada and who helped you get here. But I want to turn to Bilal Sarwari now, who has just arrived three weeks ago, I believe. Bilal, is that right? Thank you. It's good to be with you. Yes, uh, three months, uh, three weeks old now in Canada. Uh, we are uh, just being moved into another hotel in Richmond Hill. So trying to, to know Canada better, I guess. And how is life in Canada so far? 
Life is great in Canada. Uh, we are being moved by how uh, nice and friendly Canadians are towards us, how helpful they've been. And obviously it is a new life, a new journey from scratch. So we're trying to learn as much as we can because this is now our, our home. And you're there with, your, you came with your wife, a small child, and, I, and who else came with you? My parents are here, my wife and our baby daughter, Sola. She's almost two months old, so we are here, yes. Remind me what Sola means. Uh, Sola means peace uh, in Pashto, and I named her Sola because I had lost so many of my friends and close relatives, and we were pinning our hopes on the idea that Afghanistan will finally get uh, both a credible peace process as well as a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire. And where I come from in Eastern Afghanistan from a district called Khaskunar, uh, the, the flow of coffins just never stopped because it was providing soldiers to the previous government. So finally in our home, we reached uh, the decision that, okay, if I had a baby daughter, we're going to name her Sola, which means peace. But unfortunately, uh, all of our dreams were shattered and we were forced to leave uh, the country. So Sola was the only piece who came into your, into your life then? Absolutely. We are grateful that she came in into our lives and I hope that she can have uh, the same opportunities that any other kid uh, will have. And I hope that someday she can understand why we made the decision of leaving because generations of Afghans were forced to make similar decisions for their children, uh, especially so young. And, uh, you know, I can't even explain to you how I felt because I only was able to bring my laptop, two of my phones and a pair of clothes. This is all we could get out of Kabul. And on the same plane that I left towards Qatar, 150 of my colleagues from media and civil society and all walks of life, people who were committed over the last 20 years, uh, the, the, the educated Afghans, they were with us. And to me, it felt like a tsunami of brain drain, you know, in Afghanistan, not only just that plane, but around the airport for 13 hours, I saw so many civil servants, so many capable Afghans working in the Ministry of Economy, you know, ordinary Afghans who had invested their dreams and energy and people who genuinely really believed that Afghanistan could have a peace process over the years. So perhaps it was the most uh, painful journey on one level, but on another level, at least we were lucky to, to leave uh, the country and to reach the safety uh, here in Canada, a country that had offered me resettlement a month before Kabul fell, but I never thought even in my wildest, uh, you know, uh, dreams and imaginations that the Taliban will be able to take over the country without a fight, without resistance so quickly and that everything will crumble. Can you tell us about that moment, that moment when you realized you had to go? I was sitting in my office, which was next to my home, and uh, the Taliban visits were so frequent, although I knew a lot of these Taliban figures, at least the younger ones, because we were communicating, especially for my work. Uh, and then I was told that I would uh, need to be at the Serena Hotel a car would come and pick me up and that I could not tell anyone. And to be honest with you, to not be able to even uh, grab the picture of our wedding or anything important, you know, was uh, extremely painful. Once we were in the car, uh, there was no traffic on that day. Usually it will take like 30 minutes as Graham would know from his time in Afghanistan. Uh, and it was perhaps the most painful and the most fearful of the journeys that I had. Uh, and once we were in the Serena Hotel, you know, uh, inside there was music, there was a lot of food, but outside of the hotel, we heard sporadic gunshots. Uh, we heard a lot of, you know, uh, movement of Taliban fighters inside the hotels, they would come and go. And we were told that the flights could not take, uh, you know, off from Kabul uh, because there was an imminent threat from the Islamic State. So for two nights, I barely slept uh, you know, in the room that I shared with uh, my family. And then finally, one day the Qatari ambassador came in and said, fine, we're, we're leaving. And we left, I think, 2 a.m. in the morning. 
the only people who were awake on that night were Taliban fighters, younger fighters, you know, with long uh, hair, you know, like very strong, tall uh, guys with heavy machine guns and AK-47s. Uh, literally, you know, through every checkpoint, the buses were stopped. The Qatari ambassador's motorcade was there. They were negotiating with the Taliban escort. And once we got inside the airport, I think it was the last checkpoint. The Americans and their uh, allies from the counterterrorism pursuit teams, these sort of brutal units of Afghans, you know, who were known for brutal tactics over the years, were literally in two meters distance from the Taliban. So to see these guys, you know, fight for 20 years and see that distance between them was uh, quite simply uh, surreal. And, uh, you know, then as soon as we arrived, I think it was around like 4.30 in the morning, thousands of people were there in the airport, including women and children. And it was just, you know, uh, it, it was unbelievable. Uh, because if I remember during the 1990s, when I was forced as a kid to leave Afghanistan when there was civil war, this was another repeat of the 1990s uh, in, in many ways, you know, especially the younger, uh, you know, children, women, and those who are the most educated, you know, the most effective ones literally leaving. I think fear was prevailing, you know, there was uncertainty, yes, but there was, everyone had this fear in their minds and hearts you know people did not simply trust the taliban they did not trust the city the situation they could not take the risk to to stay behind and that risk that uh, threat that you mentioned was a real threat and there was a an attack uh, at, at and near the airport that killed many people um and also what we saw the most frightening thing seeing people holding to the side of of aircraft as they were departing and falling to their deaths as they did that. And I, when you say that it was, you say it was one of the most painful and frightening journeys that you have made. And that says a lot because I know where you have been all through the country during these past two decades. I, I can't imagine how frightening that was. Uh, I want to just ask Graham, now, Graham uh, Smith now because he as tremendous experience in Afghanistan and saw much of this. But I want to ask, uh, Graham, I just want to begin actually with a different story, just temporarily, because um, you work for the International Crisis Group and there's different news overnight of a ma another man who worked for the International Crisis Group, Michael Kovrig, who, uh, as we know, arrived early this morning into Canada after more than a thousand days of being in a Chinese prison without any contact with, uh, or very little contact with anybody. And I just, I wonder how you feel, how you felt when you heard the news that he was free. Yeah, I felt great relief. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, if, if you had any doubt that this was a hostage, hostage taking, um, maybe the timing of the release um, should erase that in your mind in the sense that, um, Clearly, it wasn't coincidental the 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 timing that uh, the person that China was concerned about got released, and then the two Michaels got released shortly afterwards. Um, so, not a not a strong moment for the rule of law, but a, a great moment for the families involved. So, um, we, but we knew we knew eventually the Michaels would be released, right? They had the the international community had Canada. Uh, championing their cause. I just wonder how often you see you have seen people who didn't have that backup, who didn't have had very little expectations or hope of getting out of where they were, the situations they were in. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, there have been a lot of um, a lot of kidnappings. Um, of, of people that I've that I've known um, in Afghanistan, typically the the foreigners get a lot of attention, and the the local people don't. Um, commercial kidnapping, in particular, was a huge problem for years uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, I have to say that it's often done in the capital, Kabul, by uh, gangs of thugs who are associated with the previous government. So. Um, uh, I don't know whether that's going to get uh, better or worse uh, now or in Afghanistan. Um, 
yeah, quite a nasty business, um, commercial kidnapping. Um, and, and, and beyond just pe uh, beyond people who are kidnapped, people who are just in a situation that, as you saw so often with uh, prisoners of, that were taken by Canadian forces and transferred into the prison system in Afghanistan, where you learned that they were tortured and abused. Uh, <laughs> that was one of the most important stories I think you broke. It was, the, I think, the first time Canadians realized that, had questions about what on earth we were doing in that country. So that was, I'm thinking that of that as well. Sure, that was a turning point for me in the way I thought about the war in Afghanistan because, um, you know, there, there are some things that happen in war um, that are sort of accidental. You know, if you drop a bomb in the wrong place and children die, uh, it's possible for foreign militaries to sort of say, oops, you know, I'm sorry, and you know, occasionally there's some conversation. Um, but uh, the, the systematic torture that was going on uh, was really not accidental. It was part of the design of the war. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we still don't have a good accounting from Canada about um, what was known about uh, you know, when Can Canada was capturing prisoners and handing them over to known torturers. Did we know that they were going to be tortured? Um, it, it remains an open question and something that um, not only historians will be interested in, but I think, um, you know, there is no statute of limitation on war crimes and some of the people involved are still very much alive. So, you know, we'll see what, what, uh, what happens in the coming years or decades. But with it, what we're hearing from Hassan and Bilal, I mean, Hassan from Syria in a place where we know the Syrians were taking people, torturing them, killing them, disappearing them. We know Bilal can tell us many stories of what happened in his country, what the Taliban did, the, the disappearances, the, the torture, the murder of people. And I wonder, from your point of view, when you realize that Canada may be complicit, and certainly the United States crossed, as you called it, a, 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 to a dark place in this war that led to how you came to be so disillusioned with this entire campaign that we had and uh, the, the international forces were forging in that country. Well, yeah, and also just the, the sheer human cost of it was, was staggering. Um, you know, 30,000 to 40,000 dead Afghans on an annual basis, hundreds of thousands displaced. Uh, internally, you know, an external uh, migration crisis as well. Um, the sheer level of carnage involved in the war can't be overstated. Um, and I got a message from a friend uh, today who's in Sandy District, one of the toughest parts of uh, one of the toughest provinces uh, in the entire country of Oman. Uh, and today, Sangin is at peace. Um, you know, the, the village uh, has been almost completely ruined by by bombs, you know, it's, it's a, a husk of what it was previously a bustling market town. Um, but, you know, today the bombs are not falling on the villages. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there are lots of terrible things happening now in Afghanistan today, but um, it is no longer the deadliest war on the planet earth. Uh, so, you know, um, pluses and minuses, I guess, to the Taliban takeover. Um, and but as B Bilal was describing, being on a plane with all kinds of media workers, and uh, uh, I have been involved also with efforts to try and bring Afghan journalists to Canada and uh, translators, fixers, people we worked with, people we know, uh, even if we didn't work with them, we, we learned from them. We couldn't have done our work in that country without them. I just wonder if you are on a kind of daily basis, looking for news of friends, um, to see friends, people you work with, people you know, who are still trying to get out. Yeah, I was really um, touched by uh, Bilal and Hassan's stories of their journeys, um, in part because of, you know, just their tenacity and bravery should be applauded, but also because of the sort of dislocating effect of modernity, I guess, where some few of us, you know, I'm lucky enough to be speaking to you from Tuscany in this beautiful part of the world. 
Um, and then my my phone is absolutely full of updates from people who are, you know, in really terrible, difficult parts of Afghanistan. Um, and uh, I'm sure that that our other guests on this panel have the same experience of um, it's it's sort of a head snapping contrast uh, where we exist simultaneously in these very different worlds and these different worlds are, are brought together now thanks to all of the electronics in our hands um, and so it is you know it, 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 it it's a strange coexistence between heaven and hell I guess uh, in some ways and these electronics in our hands this is what Hassan used in order to communicate his situation and become a kind of floating ambassador for his country. Um, and we know that, I mean, Syria and Afghanistan are, are very different countries, very different situations, different wars. But in both cases, both of these countries had looked to the world, looked to us, had people had expectations that we would do something, that we, prom we, we, uh, we who uphold the ideas of democracy, we who uphold the ideas of fairness and rights and human rights, that we would be there and that we had the United States especially made commitments that it had their backs. We made those commitments. And I, I just want to open up a discussion a bit with everybody because I just, about the expectations that others have of Canada and what it role it should play. And from Graham's point of view, what, what he believes Canada's role should be in, in the world. Um, we'll just, I, I'll just read something that um, Graham said in Ghosts of Afghanistan in this documentary, he opens and he says, I'm heartbroken about the way things went in Afghanistan. Powerful armies arrived with slogans about peace, democracy, and women's rights. It was a disaster. Whatever they leave behind, it's not what we promised. That's from Afghanistan. We know in, in Syria, the United States, uh, uh, the, probably the one president that in both Afghanistan and Syria made the strongest commitment that he would, we, he had their backs was Barack Obama. And yet we saw at that crucial time during his presidency when he said the red line would be if Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons on his own people. And then we saw that red line cross. Then we saw Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons on his own people in Syria. And then red line after red line was crossed after that. And no one showed up. And Hazan, I want to start with you. What, 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 did you, what did you think? What did you, from your country's point of view and your countrymen's point of view, what expectations did you have from our democracies? None. Because I know that uh, it, it does not surprise, you, surprise me at all, even what happened recently in Afghanistan, which is devastating and a disaster itself. But uh, none because I know that the Western democracies are working internally, domestically for their, for their uh, societies and their own people. But when it comes to their foreign policies, they look into profits and where's the state interest, where they can make money, where they can make some deals and uh, to, have, to have the human rights as their priority, it's, it's, it's not there, it's not on their agenda. I can give uh, an example by, by Canada and China and uh, the guys who just arrived to, to Toronto yesterday and uh, the Igor in China is suffering since hundreds of years and uh, yet we still have making our trades with China and uh, uh, things are going well economically so it's not there uh, the human rights and uh, they failed us. Uh, the system failed us, the United Nations, the super government, uh, the, the, the free world leaders, especially Barack Obama, they failed us. And in a way, I think they get advantage of the Syrian situation by make their own countries free of terrorists, by facilitating uh, their escape to the Syrian land where they could be killed by the Syrian forest or by uh, by the people there or by the, the fight is going there. So they are making their own countries more safe in our coast as Syrian people. And that's something I, I would Tell the American, for example, at when, when they had the travel ban for Syria at the time of Donald Trump, uh, where no Syrian can enter 
United States. Um, it's not the Syrians who had uh, uh, boots on ground on Washington borders or New York borders. You have eight military grounds in Syria, and uh, there were and still 850 jihadi with uh, with a U.S. aid citizenship fighting within Syria, uh, and that's the refugee problem. We are the result of terror where the whole world decide to make us a war zone. Believe it or not, in Syria, I, if you hear the news, there is some, uh, an army, Sweden pilots bombing in Syria. And in recent reports, they said they need a training for a real compact. We are helping them getting practice, military practice within Syria. And uh, no one is coming with solution. They are all happy with what they have. No one is coming with solution. It's interesting what you say, because we do know that one of the strategies is to contain wars, that, that they consider it successful. If they, the war is going on there, we can put a firewall and it doesn't spread elsewhere. And that's considered to be, I'm sure at the International Crisis Group, you heard that kind of language by him. I just want to turn to Bilal about because it was different in Afghanistan because Barack Obama called it the just war. Um, Canada showed up saying that we were going to make it a safe place for girls to go to school. We invested billions of dollars. We lost lives. We, I mean, we, 158 Canadians died, but thousands others were wounded. And, uh, and this was an investment. We thought, other countries thought that we were, we were nation building. And yet here we are at this point, Bilal, with the Taliban in, in power right back at the beginning. What, 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 did, what did you get for all of that? I think uh, the mistake by the Americans to shut the door towards negotiations earlier on was one of the biggest mistakes, 2002, three, four, that period. I think the use of uh, you know, airstrikes, both by the Americans uh, and later on by the Afghan government, uh, that escalation uh, by the Taliban to bring in truck bombs, you know, and, and, and blow them in the middle of the cities, uh, all taught us that there was never a military solution, that there was no winner. And I hope uh, that the former president, you know, who in my view is a coward, Ashraf Ghani, who abandoned the Af Afghan people in Afghanistan, uh, as well as uh, the former president, Hamid Karzai, and all these different Afghan politicians uh, should be ashamed of, this, of themselves because they never put the country ahead of their self-interest. But at the same time, I think the Americans are also to be blamed because what they sold to the world and to everyone else as a peace process was nothing more than an US Taliban exit deal it missed the component of a successful peace process. For example, the victims were never there. They didn't have a representation. And I remember, Carol, a time when I lost way too many friends, I would be on this international news channel, literally breaking my heart to tell them about Afghanistan. You know, I had, it was my job to tell them what was happening. But it was all about Doha. It was a very smart PR operation. But what had happened over the years, these talks in Doha did not stop the bloodshed, the carnage, the destructive wave of attacks, the killings of Afghans on all sides. And to me, it looks like the Taliban were not only very confident that they had a military victory, but they knew that the Americans were leaving. If you look at uh, Trump, if you look at uh, Biden, the, the way they like conducted themselves there. Uh, so I'm afraid that was one of the biggest mistakes, if you ask me. If you ask me also, uh, they put up with a lot of corruption uh, and, and you know, a lot of the abuse, both in the previous government under President Karzai and then under President Ghani at the time. And they simply did not hold these guys accountable, but they also failed uh, to stop uh, the Pakistanis from meddling in, in Afghan affairs. Uh, but no one is to blame more here than Afghans, uh, both within the government and outside, because for three years they failed to be on the same page about the peace process. They failed to prevent the flow of coffins to Afghan villages. 
I can tell you more about it uh, in, in areas that were under the government control because I didn't have access in Taliban areas, but I was hearing and talking to a lot of these Taliban and the impact of these coffins going back was, uh, you know, it was like, uh, you know, the weight of each coffin was like a thunder, uh, you know, falling from the skies, destroying families, societies, you know, uh, you had so many widows, so many orphans. And in many ways, both within the Taliban and the Afghan government, they were fighting this war on the back of very poor communities and villages. And it, it did break my heart more towards 2017, 18, 19, because I saw how this war was crippling Afghanistan, you know? And to me, there is always a book of errors if you look back to the last 20 years. But the biggest mistake, the biggest error was that we failed to negotiate with the Taliban. We failed to invest in the peace process earlier on. Uh, and now that the Taliban have taken over Afghanistan militarily and by force with much of resistance, they have managed to secure surrenders. The Taliban today are struggling to keep Afghanistan functional because it is one thing for them to fight and it's another to govern. At the same time, uh, we know that there is a very mysterious string of assassinations going on where members of the former Afghan National Security Forces, commanders, you know, middle level commanders, especially in the Afghan Special Forces are being killed mysteriously. Uh, alone from Eastern provinces of Nengarhar in Kunar, I can tell you because I know some of those families. And it, 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 it is just, you know, extremely heartbreaking uh, to see that the violence has not stopped. Uh, yes, there is a new government in place, whether we like it or we don't like it, Taliban or the rulers, but the brutality continues, you know, these, these murders continue and perhaps a lot of it has to do with the fact that fighters from the Taliban are trying to settle old score. These are revenge killings, these are retributions. Uh, so on, on the other hand, Afghanistan is a country that is suffering on the economic front. Uh, people can't withdraw their cash, you know. There's no money in ATM machines. People are selling their household items on the roadside, something that I witnessed as a kid during the 1990s. These are uh, extreme uh, examples uh, of, of poverty, you know. And the prices of food commodities are going up. Uh, state institutions, everything crumbled. So the Taliban are operating in a vacuum and it will be interesting to see how the Taliban can now govern, how can they make that transition. But we also know of rivalries between the Haqqani network and Taliban fighters and leaders and commanders from the South. How can they create unity? How can they go ahead? Uh, you know, we we'll have to wait and see, uh, but it does break my heart to receive in my WhatsApp uh, you know, messages of, of such brutality, killings, often videos, which, which are too grotesque to share uh, with anyone. And unfortunately, when you have each murder, uh, which are, you know, executions, uh, you are talking about a family losing their breadwinner. You're talking about a, a, a young Afghan woman losing a husband. You're talking about, you know, a, a little kid being deprived of, of his father. And unfortunately, this has been happening for the last 40 years. Various Afghans have been killing each other. And, and it is the never ending tragedy and suffering, I believe, for the Afghan people. Uh, just a, a note to everyone on the panel that uh, can you uh, mute your microphones? People are I, I'm getting comments from people in the audience that there's noise in the other rooms. <laughs> Um, and so if you just mute your mic so we can hear uh, the speakers properly. Graham, I, I just, um, I know that you've, well, you've written and spoken a lot about many of the things that Bilal was just saying, um, and uh, just about the things that we did, uh, the foreigners did to basically drive a lot of Afghans into the arms of the Taliban. I just, uh, I, I'm sure you have heard what I have heard from people, people people that I actually respect, people actually who care 
who said, well, well, what was all that about? What did we get for the billions we invested? They're just it's right back to the beginning. Why couldn't they get their act together? Why didn't why did all those soldiers defect? Why did things why did things go the way they went? Why did they capitulate? Why is there nothing uh, far more advanced now that these are the questions people I, that I actually respect to ask me, and I spend a lot of time trying to to talk about that. And I'm sure you're hearing it as well. What what did Maybe ask the as far as you know, what came of this enormous international effort in Afghanistan? You're right. I've, I've spent a lot of my professional life talking about Afghanistan, and I have to say, Bilal says it better than I possibly could. So it's uh, uh, I just listen to him most of the time. But uh, to be honest, in the last couple of months, it's one of the few occasions I found myself sort of speechless. Um, I was shocked by the events. Like a lot of Western analysts, I got it wrong. I didn't expect the Taliban to uh, have a full military takeover of the country. It, it caught me off guard. Um, and I think the, the news is still settling in in some ways. Uh, I'm doing work now for the International Crisis Group. I'm I'm back with them actually for my third time with, with Crisis Group. And, and we're doing sort of immediate short-term stuff you know, how to address the humanitarian situation, how to understand the new Taliban cabinet. Now, uh, as Bilal says, how to avoid state collapse because there are hundreds of thousands of state employees who are not getting paid, including uh, health workers. Uh, funding for two thirds of the health facilities in the country has just been cut off, um, including people who run girls schools, they're not getting paid. Um, so, you know, it's very sort of immediate short-term stuff. And, and these broader questions that you're raising about what was it all for? You know, should we have invaded in the first place? If we, sh if we didn't need to invade in Afghanistan, what about a case like Syria, you know, where, uh, as you say, uh, lines were crossed and the cavalry did not come. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, the short answer is that I, I simply don't know. Um, as, as Bilal says, you know, there are entire libraries that can be filled with books of all the mistakes that were made in Afghanistan. Um, in my view, one of the first mistakes was invading in the first place. Um, I've written the foreword for a book called uh, Delivering Osama, where the author pretty convincingly lays out what some other authors have said, which is that um, essentially there were negotiations going on with the Taliban before 9-11 to obtain Osama and after 9-11 to obtain Osama. And that um, really, if the West had shown some more patience with the Taliban, they could have simply, you know, had Al-Qaeda delivered a silver platter. And uh, I think the reality is that post 9-11, there was a real appetite to invade somewhere. Um, and we did, and it didn't go well. Um, and there are lots of things that we could have done along the way um, to invade uh, in, a, in a more sensible way, as Bilal says, you know, lots of missed opportunities early on to negotiate with the Taliban. Um, some of those were on Canada's doorstep, actually. Um, it was very unpopular in Canada to even raise the idea of negotiating with the Taliban. Uh, the late NDP leader, Jack Dayton, was uh, branded Taliban Jack for raising that idea in the House of Commons. Um, you know, that later became formal US policy, but that took a dozen years. And uh, he was dead by the time his idea was, was mainstream. So, you know, um, I, so I, I don't, I'm not offering a, an, an overarching view of you know, when we have a so-called responsibility to protect, you know, the, the doctrine that was uh, in part invented in Canada that, you know, we should invade in some cases to, to help the people of a country. My, my own uh, experience, I, you know, having spent most of my professional life in a completely disastrous war is that, you know, I, I, I'm really skeptical about the use of military force for so-called humanitarian purposes. Um, and I think we need to invent um, diplomatic systems, you know, uh, global uh, legal systems that um, can address some of these things with non-military tools. Um, but 
you know, that's my perspective having worked in Afghanistan. And I expect, you know, Hassan coming from the Syria context would have a really different view. No, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I? Uh, Go ahead. I, 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 I totally agree with him. He said a, a great uh, point, uh, saying that uh, he don't think that we should uh, be military involved uh, uh, for a humanitarian basis, and I totally agree with that because I think we learn from the history that we don't learn from history, especially when it comes to USA and. Uh, Coming from a different part of the world, from Syria, we have a different way how to look into the Western communities and the Western policies, especially United States, uh, uh, that uh, they use uh, all muscles in their body except their brain muscle, and that's why uh, that's why and and uh, they did not even learn in Iraq. They don't know when the moment uh, to uh, to withdraw, and they keep going, and uh, they don't have a plan, a structure, well structured plan. They made a daily basis plan uh, depending on the uh, uh, events they are having on a daily basis but they they show that they are stuck in the situation and I wrote this in my book when I said that oh we have a problem with all the conquerors and all the invaders they don't understand the mentality of people uh, what uh, words like uh, integrity uh, owner and uh, uh, me and our land means to us and that's why the minute you throw in a regime you become yourself an, uh, an occupational for us you become the enemy because people they don't have any more enemies uh, but I, uh, to be honest with you, what I care about all the situation is Canada, not the USA, because I know the way how the Arabs or the Middle East or the Syrian look into Canada. And we have a great uh, human rights uh, reputation in that part of the world where Canada equal human rights. That's the uh, idealistic uh, dream for all Arabs and Syrian refugees. And we should capitalize on that. That because it makes us uh, lovable and popular among people. And that will help us even in our foreign policy if we depend on the societies, not the governments. Uh, but uh, that's why we should, I think we should more independent uh, in our uh, uh, war, uh, war uh, call or uh, to, to keep fighting under, under the American flag. Is that the, in the best interest of Canada or should we approach other uh, uh, issues on a humanitarian basis? And now I work for the Red Cross and I know that Canadian were, were Red Cross, if we had the, uh, if we gave the opportunity uh, to work with the, uh, with the Syrian Red Cross and or Lebanese Red Cross and uh, to uh, educate these people, train them, give them the equipment, we may capitalize in these societies and it would be a better win for us to change these minds. But with the situation now, uh, after 20 years war in Afghanistan and uh, uh, the, scene, the scenes we saw in video, the way they withdrew, that's something you expect from the Syrian regime, but you cannot expect from a superpower. They had the, the deadline, they knew the day they were drawing months and year before that, and they could not even plan their withdrawal. And uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, an Afghani, and Bilal knows for sure more than me. And uh, I heard him when he said that he is uh, overwhelmed with all the messages. I am overwhelmed with all the messages because I'm still working as an advocate for refugees. The Afghani people who are sending me messages and the, even the Canadian people and the American people who think that I could help an Afghanistan situation uh, devastating and heartbreaking. Uh, we should know by now after the Syrian war, the Iraqi war, Syria, no one is speaking about a solution by the way after 11 years. Okay, let, no me, years. let me put this out to all of you because here's, a, here's a, a larger geopolitical issue, which is that the Syrian war, Hassan, produced so many people who had to leave Syria, uh, Iraq as well. Millions of people were on the move in from 2011, 2015 and on. Uh, Afghanistan produced, uh, the second largest refugee producing area was Afghanistan. All of these people on the move, looking for some place, crossing the Mediterranean, drowning their, their children, losing their kids, losing their everything in order to get to someplace safe. The same time creating 
crisis in the countries that they were landing in, what was Germany or most of Europe and, and countries that almost had a, a successful a extreme right wing uh, governments or not governments, but at least parties that, that gained traction in their countries, that uh, this had a, had a huge effect on other countries, this influx of refugees. We're seeing in the United States right now, people coming from the South, crossing into the United States, crossing into Texas, creating another crisis of people saying, we don't want these people here. We don't want them here. They're creating instability there. That. So that's, that's the, the larger geopolitical crisis that's created from all these places. And so you're going to get a, 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 a feedback, you're going to get a, a rejection that comes from people being afraid of the other. And I, I, I'd like to hear from all three of you on the subject of how do we how do we find a place, a way for people to stay in their countries or stay in their regions? Is that possible? No, it's not possible. Climate change is going to make parts of the planet Earth uninhabitable. Uh, we need to normalize very large movements of human beings from places that are not good at supporting life to places that are good at supporting life. Um, I was struck by, um, during this recent airlift of Afghans out of Kabul, um, the Rockefellers were chartering aircraft and moving people to Uganda. George Soros was negotiating with the leadership of Albania and chartering aircraft into Albania. All of a sudden, being a human trafficker was a respectable profession. And um, that is going to be a change that I think will continue. Um, rescuing people from situations of extreme risk is a noble thing. Um, Canada used to be the terminus of the Underground Railroad. Um, you know, we remember those people as heroes today. And I think um, we need to rethink the way that migration works. And um, I think Canada is a good place to start because um, uh, Canada is one of the few places where you can see an election campaign where people yell at each other for not accepting enough uh, desperate Afghans, um, which is quite surprising and, and, and quite nice for me. You know, I, I, I deal a lot with European diplomats, uh, American diplomats. Um, the, the conversations are very, very different inside a lot of other countries. Um, it's, it's really in Canada where we can uh, sort of have the luxury of, of this kind of conversation. And it's a conversation that really needs to start and, and really accelerate to keep up with um, global changes. I, I regret that I, I have to go. Uh, I, I wish I could join you for the rest of the conversation. Uh, Graham, just Graham, are you still there? I just need, I was muted. I didn't realize. I just want to ask you, Graham, before you go, I need to ask you one question um, because you said it in the documentary and I just want to know, you said that, you said that you went to the theater one night and you, for some reason, started to cry and uh, you couldn't stop weeping and, um, and you never explained in the documentary why, why it created that. Do you know why? I was at a, a performance of uh, Oslo at the Lincoln Center in New York. And um, it's a wonderful play. I suggest you all see it. Um, it's the story of a failed effort by some Norwegian uh, diplomats and NGO people um, who were trying to uh, find peace between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. And um, uh, ultimately that did not work, uh, but they tried and, uh, and they failed. And, um, and that's what happened in Afghanistan as well. And um, so, yeah, it was very emotional. And so did you feel, have a sense that things were hopeless? Those were tears of, 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 uh, of hope, I think at that time, because um, just like Bilal, you know, uh, dreaming these dreams of peace and uh, naming his child's peace. Um, I, I think a lot of us who 
uh, had spent so, so many years um, involved in the war in Afghanistan, um, we were tired of watching this sort of human meat grinder grind away. And, um, and so this idea of peace was, was quite moving. Graham, I know you have to go because it's extremely late in Tuscany. And uh, though I think just by virtue of being in Tuscany, you should have to stay just so we can feel a bit of your the vibe from that beautiful place. But I do appreciate that you be with us. And I know you've got uh, an early uh, rising tomorrow. And so we'll let you we'll let you go. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh -huh. I just want to turn to Bilal to expand on some of the stuff we we're just talking about, as far as the that that this this fear that the world has that people become on the move and uh, and don't want them the fear of the other. And you've arrived in a country, Bilal, that um, actually has the luxury of not sharing a border with a refugee-producing country or region. We're probably the only country in the world that doesn't, and so we can control as we did with you, with your arrival, as we did with Hassan's arrival, we have a great deal of control over who comes to our country. And so we may have a bit of a luxury that others don't, um, but what are the expectations, do you think, of the world when it comes to the refugees who are arriving? I, I, I think we, we must not, and we should not turn our back on any of these situations, whether you talk about Afghanistan or the tragedy in Syria, or even the situation in Iraq for all those years, because uh, humanity in the end uh, must win. And we must you know, help um, people who are desperate. Uh, but from what I have seen uh, you know, here in, in Canada, uh, as I said, only I've been here for three weeks, we went to a hospital uh, for a checkup that we had to do, it was mandatory. And, my wife and my parents and myself, we were waiting uh, to be called by the doctor. And close to us, there was a Afghan woman. She needed translation. I think she had like six children. And suddenly my wife started having a conversation with her and she said that she lost her husband to a suicide car bomb in the heart of Kabul city seven years ago. Uh, and at that moment, you know, it, it just like, really hit me hard. I, I got all very emotional because I saw these seven children, but yet I saw this strong Afghan mother who had not only educated her kids, but you know, continued to insist that they must be you know, having a brighter future. And the only reason why she was able to leave Kabul and come to Canada, because her parents, uh, Canadian passport holders, were somehow in Kabul. They were there to spend some time with the family. And despite all of those chaotic scenes and threats, uh, you know, she was able to basically make it here. And I think Canada, to me, is is that country where no matter where you're from, you know, so long you're here, you've got the opportunity for yourself and for your children uh, to move away from those painful. Uh, you know, personal losses and memories and, and build new lives. Uh, I myself am, am someone who studied uh, in the U.S. I went to school in, in Vermont in Middlebury. And uh, quite frankly, you know, America never really appealed to me as much as I love America. Uh, because uh, that, that, that is the simple truth. So Canadians, I'm sure, will have certain expectations from us, you know, when we come in and we start living in this country, uh, that, that is going to be not an easy transition because we have to learn about everything here. Uh, but at the end of the day, I have seen how generous Canada has been with the number of people that they have accepted and how we have received help, including from people like yourself, Carol. And uh, that's, you know, that is, what is giving us strength, that is what is giving that Afghan mother the strength of all the suffering and pain and uh, difficulties that she has gone through. And she said it very clearly that I have lived for these children. I think four of them were girls and three were boys. Uh, so 
you know, I hope that uh, Afghans who have come in this time can prove that they can be successful in this country, that they can have a successful transition. And I hope that they can also uh, contribute to Canada, uh, you know, um, as, as they resettle here in, in their home. Uh, Bilal, I will say you are most welcome. And I, I know the vast majority of Canadians feel that way as well. And we have many Afghans who have already arrived and they are thriving and they are making an enormous contribution. There is no one can have any, uh, any, any other view except that it's, it's, it's our gain and your loss. As you say, that the people on the plane, you looked, you looked at the brain drain just in that one flight that you were leaving with and the people that were going. And Hassan, it's the same from Syria. We have so many Syrians now. Um, I would just look at the numbers. We had, you know, uh, since 2015, 45,000 Syrian refugees have arrived in Canada. Um, and uh, there should have been more. Uh, this Afghanistan, Af uh, Canada has committed to taking from this, just this recent crisis, 20,000 plus uh, Af Afghan refugees, but they are plans to double that to 40,000. So, and in all these cases, I, I will attest to just the tremendous benefit that's been to our country and the tremendous loss that your countries have suffered. But just Hassan, just to back the, the question, what do you think our responsibility is to these large migrations of people in the world? Well, uh, let me start with the numbers, uh, even the Syrian numbers or uh, the Afghan Sunni numbers. It may sound that uh, it's a lot, but it's not. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very average. And as you said, we have a very high standards uh, here in Canada of whom we are accepting. Uh, and we fail a lot of time into a big bureaucracy. Uh, it, it takes uh, normally an application uh, 24 months to be uh, approved if it get approved with the security check. I'm not against that entirely. I want this community to be safe. I want them to check, recheck, and then check again, because uh, I know that no matter what happened, we will, for the rest of our, our lives, uh, we will be always Syrian refugees. I'm here since almost three years, and they still uh, introduce me as the former Syrian refugee. And, uh, I made my peace with that. It's not who I am, it's who I'm forced to be. But anyway, uh, Germany, for example, so far accepted a million, uh, 700,000 to a million Syrian refugee. And that will circle me back to what you said before, Graham, that, uh, that we should base some efforts uh, to stable, uh, to make, to keep people in their countries. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do at the end of the day. Uh, yes, we want uh, the whole world to be stable, but uh, human rights are not selective. Uh, we cannot, uh, 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 it's not pick and match. Uh, people have the right to immigrate and to relocate. Uh, if you studied the Syrian case, uh, the Syrian refugee uh, in Canada, uh, take me as an example. I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm since the pandemic started, and uh, for a year now, I'm living in hotels in different city in in the front line, trying to help with the uh, with the vaccination and the testing. We are um, um, a skilled, educated, cultural people, and uh, who could bring a new ideas and blood to this country and contribute in the in the economy and uh, the way uh, people live here they could need they may need some fresh blood and uh, and ideas same the afghani uh, uh, refugees will do the same uh, um, when i knew that bilal arrived three weeks ago now i feel a genuine happiness that he is here and he is saying that uh, uh, he start with the small stories and uh, i will tell him to give himself sometimes he will have a lot of these small stories which will be priceless because they will generate a lot of feeling and they will made him uh, fell in love more and more with this country. Uh, give it some time. Uh, it's only three weeks. You will love it more and more. And uh, it, because he knows how hard it is. And that's what Canadians are taking for granted. They think that uh, they complain. And 
I agree, people should raise their voices, they should criticize, it's a sign of uh, being alive and uh, in a democracy, but at the end of the day, what we have here is the impossible dreams for millions and millions around the globe, and uh, we should be thankful, and we should be grateful for it, and, um, and that's why I cannot find uh, anything bad with this country, and uh, it, it may sound silly, but if that's for a reason. For me, Canada is is not is not a country. It's it's an idea. Uh, it's a feeling. Uh, it's a symbol. It's uh, for the first time after forty years, I am finally a free man. You, as a Canadian, cannot feel what I'm saying because you born a free. You have, you came to this world a free woman, and you know uh, you are practicing your freedom. But I did not for forty years. I never voted, and uh, um, th that's why I know why Canada for the rest of the world is uh, is something different. And uh, being a storyteller, I will tell you a quick story. I accidentally, while I was working with Red Cross in, at the border site, I crossed to the American USA border. And uh, when they said, uh, the, when they said, where are you from? I uh, tried to be clever and I said, I am a permanent resident of Canada. And they said, no, what's your nationality? I said, Syrian. And that's when the problems start. They kept me for three hours and uh, they investigated me yet again. And that's why I, when I knew that nothing is for granted in this life. And the kind of questions they kept asking me, when did my late father serve his military? And what kind of weapon did he train? And that was during the 70s. I, I was not born at that time. And then when I allowed me to came back, the Canadian immigration officer, a very fine lady, she said, only two words will come home. And she thought that she is only telling me something uh, ordinary, a figure of speech. But for me, the word home, yes, this is home. Imagine my situation. If I was only Hassan, the Syrian refugee, not Hassan, the permanent residence of Canada. And that's the beauty we are having here as refugees. And that's why I'm far away from my home, trying to pay back to the community. Uh, but yes, I, know. I can speak until tomorrow about this subject, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, and I, 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 I hear you as, about people's experiences in Canada are positive, but it's also true to say that when you look at Germany, where they didn't, didn't take a million people, a million people walked into their country over, over a period of eight months, and they took them. And, uh, and the country didn't collapse, you know, and, uh, and we, uh, that, we... I, let me, I'm sorry to interrupt. They have a 9,000 doctor, uh, students, doctors, Syrian student doctors now in the uh, Germany university, 9,000, 8,000 pharmacists and unknown number of nurses. And that's, that's priceless at the time of pandemic. And that's what they are capitalizing for. That's what Germany did. And that's what Canada should do as well, because I, they are full of potentials. That is a, such a, a interesting numbers. And I, 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 yeah, thank you for that. Because we shouldn't, as we pat ourselves on the back, um, we, this, these are not huge numbers and we can control every single person just as Bilal is now going through a process of security checks and these, these medical checks, you are still going, it takes years, all of this takes years. And uh, we have, we, that's how we control things. And so we can feel so good about ourselves at the end of the day, and we should, but at the same time, it's not what others are going to. Um, there's a couple of, there's some questions from the audience. We, we have about 12 minutes left and I just wanna to get to some of these that people are asking. Um, I, I, there's a, a long question, and I'll try and from uh, uh, Major Lemaire, and I want to ask this question because this is a, someone who served in Afghanistan, and um, he starts off, Major Lemaire says, I apologize if this question seems insensitive. However, I'm asking as someone who served with the Canadian forces for 10 months in Kandahar. Uh, from a foreign policy perspective, should Western nations like Canada make no long-term commitments to citizens of nations where we are embarked in nation building. 
And uh, that would be no special immigration uh, for interpreters, uh, no that refugees be treated the same as other global refugee applicants. Would this incentivize a nation like Afghanistan to build lasting institu institutions of policy and public service uh, and resist the Taliban? Um, obviously, someone who, uh, this Major Lamar, is, I think, asking what other people are asking is that, um, would things have been different had we treated the the the, uh, the people? I, I, I'll ask this last question, perhaps a more elegant way to ask, when conducting nation building, should the West stop giving people hope? That's from Major Lamar, and I'm gonna put that to Bilal. Sorry, I had some issues uh, trying to listen to your question. Uh, can you try to repeat that, please? I'll just get the last part. Uh, when conducting nation building, as a, as Canada uh, was attempting to do, should the West stop giving people hope? Well, it, it, it is a good question. I mean, I don't doubt uh, the effort that started in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. I think it was genuine. Uh, there's a lot of blood and treasure that countries like Canada, for example, invested especially in Kandahar. Uh, so I want to respect that. I think where the problem started on the Afghan side was uh, you know, the incompetence of Afghan government officials, the way that they saw the government as a milking cow, the extortions, you know, uh, the corruption, you know, stealing from a school, stealing from a clinic, stealing from the salaries of the police, and I think what we never had in Afghanistan was a transparent uh, leadership. The culture of uh, you know, impunity, I feel like prevailed all along. So what would have happened if the Americans in the international community had not come in 20 years ago? We wouldn't have the educated generation. We wouldn't have the infrastructure that we have. We wouldn't have millions of Afghans having access to internet, to mobile phones, you know? We wouldn't have Afghans uh, come and study in some of the best uh, educational institutions all over the world, including Canada. Uh, how that mission was conducted for 20 years, how many mistakes, for example, were made, uh, I think it will be for history to judge. Uh, but I definitely am a big fan of, uh, you know, how much sacrifices all of these countries made. And I know a lot of people from Canadian government to the US government, to the British government, to the Germans, to the French, who lost a lot of their friends in over the last 20 years, you know? They dedicated their lives, uh, not only to the military side of things, you know, but also to governance and helping Afghans have a better idea of how modern governance works. Uh, but perhaps it will be for historians in history to judge down the road and, you know, uh, and, and I definitely believe that Afghanistan is a better country than it was in 2001. I just wish we had not made the mistakes, too many of these mistakes. And I must also say something here about Afghanistan. I hope it's appropriate on your, uh, on this panel. If, if Afghanistan was like a shrimp, I would like to think that our neighbors are like sharks. Whether they make love or they fight, we get hurt. So there is a very regional dimension to Afghanistan, you know. You've got the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, the Sunni-Shia rivalry. You've got the Pakistani strategic depth idea, right? And to me, I, I, I just someday hope that Afghanistan's neighborhood, including Afghanistan, all of them would see, you know, convergence of interest, you know, a mutually beneficial sort of relationship where Afghanistan can be that hub, where Afghanistan can be, you know, that shining spot, whether you talk about its natural wealth or the strategic location that it has. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it is a very, very complicated part of the world with a lot of complexities, uh, you know, especially when it comes to our neighbors. And it is not to say that Afghanistan Afghanistan is the innocent one. Afghan leaders over the last many decades have made many great mistakes. Should America and should the international community ha have withdrawn militarily? Yes, they should have just done it in a more uh, orderly manner. 
Should they have kept a presence uh, in Afghanistan? Yes, to preserve the gains. Should everyone have made sure that the red lines were a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire? Yes. I think we gave way too many signals to the Taliban over the last 10, 11 years for them to have been very, very confident that one day they will have a military victory. I, I often think of that Taliban saying uh, to a New York Times reporter where the Taliban said, if the Americans had the watches, we have the time. And I mean, I know a lot of people say Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, but I think what Afghanistan truly is, is the graveyard of analogies, you know? So I wanted to use that one. Uh, and yeah, I hope that answered that question from, from the major, and I want to thank you for asking that question. But th these are my thoughts, thank you. Some very charming ideas there, but I, I, there's another question. We have time for one more audience question, and I'm going to put this to uh, Hassan. Uh, this is from Elizabeth uh, Klipsham, who asks, um, she says, Hassan is right. Canadians must practice our freedom. What is the best way to do that other than sponsoring refugees? you have an uh, answer for that, Hassan? Uh... I think we could play a, a better uh, a foreign role uh, when it comes to humanitarian NGOs and uh, uh, to, to send more Canadian people or uh, to make a partnership with our NGOs and humanitarian organization, um, uh, the Canadian humanitarian organization overseas in that part of the world and capitalize on that. Um, I think also we need uh, more space in our media to introduce refugees and that part of the world, that culture we are bringing to the Canadian people. So the people who are hesitant and uh, they have questions so we could answer them. And we, and we assure them that we are a, a, not a terrorist, we are a result of a terror. And uh, um, to build the bridge. And that's what I tried to do uh, with the book. It's, it's uh, simply a message to try to bring the gap closer between, uh, between our two parts of the world, the West and the East. Uh, Canada, I think uh, we don't need to do much with the Canada because it has a I'm exposed to the Arabic media. I know the, uh, the people there and I speak to them and uh, you have not at the, at the beginning when the pandemic start and uh, when we had the first lockdown and uh, they sent me uh, a, a small photo a picture and they said we're well, transportation free it's it was in arabic and they said in canada transportation is free they are giving them a monthly payment and they are uh, so they start uh, and healthcare is free and they start mentioning so someone sent it to me and he said is that true he just wanted to confirm. And I said, yes, what you have written is true. And he said, man, you are lucky. Is this real? And I said, yes, it is real. So at that part of the world, Canada is known. And uh, they have a, a, a bit of uh, reputation, but we should not damage that, that reputation by be a part of a war like Afghanistan, where we fail people and we showed our uh, uh, our different face. And uh, even uh, domestically, when we are having uh, serious problems, like the indigenous graveyards, where, where we start discovering all the children's uh, graves, uh, we need to deal with that uh, once for all. Otherwise, it will keep hunting us every two and three months. We need to stand to that because we are not representing ourselves only for our own people. We are representing ourselves for the world and the way we are dealing with this. Yes, we had uh, have a dark history, but we are facing it, we are dealing with it, we are trying to solve it. And that's when we should, uh, um, the, 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 the concept of uh, reconciliation that should not be only by uh, honoring the death by, by uh, uh, bringing our flag uh, down. Uh, we should do some action on the ground uh, because while we are doing that, we are representing ourselves to that part of the world. And it's important for me as a Syrian because I bring Canada and I represent it to my fellow people in, in, in my home. And I said, this is how we should build Syria. 
uh, in the Canadian way and the American way. But when a cost traffic, when a disasters like the Afghan withdrawal uh, or the uh, uh, the indigenous graves, the children happened, my I am losing my argument with my own people that. Is this the country you want us to build? It seems in the chaos, it seems they have a little, a lot of problems. So we need to face it uh, and we need to deal with it once and for all. But uh, one thing for sure, to whomever ask you the questions, uh, in that part of the world, people love Canada. And that's something we should not lose. We should, we should keep working on it. We should enhance it. And we should stop an irrational decision for a war or uh, uh, aggressive actions. Hassan and Bilal, you ha are both uh, making it so clear to everyone here and um, everyone in this country why it's so important that we open our doors because you are so insightful and so refreshing and you tell us things about ourselves as you just did now that we have to understand. And so, uh, you, Hassan, you said earlier that you, you, you people keep referring to you as a Syrian refugee or former Syrian refugee. Think about Canada is once you, are, you arrive, the moment you arrive, you are regarded as a landed immigrant. And uh, then quickly you are, uh, you go through a process, but you're not a refugee once you're here. Uh, there's a line in a poem called, home is the place that when you go there, they have to let you in. and you are both home now. Um, I'm happy that you're home. This is the home that's letting you in because this is where you belong. And we will benefit immensely from both of you being here. I'm sorry you had to leave your countries. I'm happy for us that you're here. And uh, I hope we are able to have so many more people like yourselves enter and become part of this place and teach us about ourselves. So. On behalf of all the people watching, um, and I'm hearing little messages on the side about what a wonderful discussion this has been, and I can't agree more. Thank you both so much, and welcome to Canada. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for having us. It's great to listen to Hassan. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome to Canada, Bilal. Thank you. <laughs> great to have you here. Thank you. Um, and I'll just uh, echo those thanks. Thank you so much to Hassan, Graham, Bilal, and, and Carol for this conversation. Um, such, a, such a powerful and important discussion um, to be having now and to continue having into the future. So I, I really appreciate um, you joining us here tonight. Um, uh, just a reminder that uh, we do have a book draw for tonight, um, so I want to congratulate Joan Carstairs, who won a copy of Hassan's Man at the Airport, which is out now. Um, and a reminder that if you would like to pick up uh, copies of Graham book, Graham's book or Hassan's book, uh, you can, or Carol's book, you can find those at Novel Idea Books or visit your local independent bookseller to find them. And I just want to thank you once again to everyone for joining us and for supporting Kingston Writers Fest tonight. Um, we do have another uh, day of programming tomorrow, so be sure to check out kingstonwritersfest.ca. Um, and uh, other than that, have a have a safe and healthy night. Same to you. Bye bye. <laughs>